Tonight we'll be covering the PowerPoints on Chapter 9, which is nuclear radiation. So we call it nuclear chemistry. And we'll be looking at six sections. I went ahead and gave you some feedback that some students were not getting the whole big picture. So what's really nice, when you were in perhaps grade school, high school, middle school, high school, some of your teachers let you read an outline, a text, on a particular chapter, right? And the sections, how many of you were familiar with that, right? So it's actually still a great idea to do to do that because that's one way of, a scientific way of trying to study. We don't want to just read a chemistry textbook like a novel. So we need to have a, an overview of, of, of the chapter. So I went ahead and made a copy of the outline of our, our chapter today. So our study goals are included there. So you want to want to check off. Also, one of the uh, things that I normally would do, because English is not my first language, would be I'd always write down the key bulk of words. So based on the different sections, I would always like look at the dictionary and say, what does radioactivity mean? And where did that word come from? What do we mean when we say radiation measurements? What is half-life? Right? And then what are some medical applications? Most of you will be going into the nursing, you know, allied health professions. And so you will want to look at what's MRI, PET scan, SPECT scan, CT scans, and so forth. Familiarize yourself with that. And then what's the difference between fission and fusion? So most of you, that can probably figure out if you have good uh, critical thinking skills, like Jennifer can probably figure out what fission and fusion is, right? Dad, what do you think fission is? And fusion? Or raise your hand if uh, you have prior knowledge, you know? So, remember when we were looking at in chapter one, we had, uh, we had a, a glass of water and we put uh, chunks in it and how it fizzed, right? So fission, fizz means splitting apart and fuse means going together. And we learned in chapter four, our general chemistry uh, portion of, from chapter one to chapter eight is a general chemistry portion. Now we're going into nuclear chemistry, nuclear radiation. And then the next few weeks before we'll have the organic chemistry module starting next week, and then biochemistry, the secret of life, where we talk about carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. So it's really, really very important to have a good base of the chemistry, general chemistry portion. Okay, so, so then book of words are very important. So you have study goals and also a chapter outline. So that's really important. And the key, key words, the bulk of words. So what's radiation there is explained. And the units and medical applications. As well as some, some of the bigger questions that are already in your D2L. So we can try to go over them. And also, on, on top of that, On your D2L is also concept check questions for chapter nine. Since uh, some of you mentioned that you would like to see more solved problems, so Kirella, can you share with you what your group is doing as far as going to LRC? Oh, so, um, you want to come over here? Okay. So whoever wants to join your group can sign in also. Thursday. Yes, there's a group that is meeting on Thursday. Thursday, so go ahead and share. So we, um, our group, Jatana, Martha, and I, um, we have been meeting with Josiah, which is a little bit tutor in the LRC Center. I don't know if you guys have it. And um, we ended up 
setting up a group study session. Um, we're going to try to do it every week. This week, it just so happened that our schedules worked out for Thursday, this Thursday from 6 to 8, so it's only two hours. Um, we have eight people signed up so far, so if you guys want to go, um, yeah, she was sign here, up here and, here and then take advantage, take advantage of it. Yes, yes. this Thursday from 6 to 8. Because you do, you do get some study points mm -hmm. as part of the LRC in your uh, you know, exam article. At least all, that's already in your YouTube app. So you have to So let's go ahead and talk about natural radioactivity. So what is natural radioactivity? Who can who can say it in their own words. What are the different types of radiation that we tend to run across? Okay, so Chris already has some prior knowledge because she turned in her homework. There are three or four of you that turned in, turn in your homework. And there, there are, for, for our intents and purposes, we are interested in the different types uh, we want the alpha, like Chris said, the beta, the gamma, and then the positron, which is the beta plus, the anti-electron. So when we talk about radioactive isotopes, isotopes emit radiation to become more stable and so, here are some radioisotopes that are, are typical. So when you say radioactive isotope, the nucleus is very unstable. So we learned, we learned that we have in an atom, there's a nucleus as well as the electrons orbiting the, the nucleus. So you know, radioactive isotopes, so if you take a look at magnesium, a stable isotope of magnesium has an atomic number of 12, an atomic mass unit of 24. You see that, right? And then a radioactive isotope of magnesium has an atomic number of well, but an atomic mass unit of 23. And we also have a magnesium 27. So magnesium right now has, for example, two isotopes. We also look at iodine. Some of you are probably familiar with iodine because what is that used for? To, for, for thyroids, exactly. And so you have the radioactive isotope 125 or 131. And uh, some of you, who has the four o'clock uh, lab with me? One of your classmates, actually, Erica Schweitzer. She runs the uh, nuclear lab. She's a supervisor at Holy Cross. So, yeah. And then, of course, there's uranium, right? U, U-235, and U-238. So, so nuclear radiation is the radiation emitted by unstable. So when you have to say nuclear reactivity, unstable. So, unstable atom, right? Unstable nucleus. Which give rise to alpha particles. So an alpha particle by definition is a helium atom without electrons. So then it has a representation of H, E, 4, and 2, right? No electrons. So a mass number, so a charge of 2 plus. Right, so charge two 
to us. So a beta particle is, uh, has a symbol of, it's really an electron, right? One, zero, and has a charge of what? One minus, right? No, a zero mass number. So here's the mass number. And then a positron is an anti-electron beta plus. And so it would be, let's see how is that designated? Oh, I wrote it upside down, right? Zero minus one. And then, zero. so since it's an anti-electron, I'm going to make that red. So it's zero plus one, right? And so it's also uh, so. So this is called an antimatter, right? And then we have the gamma ray, which is just zero zero plus the designated, also gamma. I'm gonna make that. And so you you see all all the different uh, the gamma rays have no charge, no mass number. And then a proton, and then a neutron, we know that from general chemistry also, right? So the new, the new particles that we're learning about are the alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus without electrons, the beta particle, which is an electron, the beta plus, which is a, this is called a positron, So this is, uh, and then the gamma ray, which is uh, very, very high energy. So uh, here's a summary. So, so if you want to give the name of an alpha radiation, what is it? Learning check. Okay. Radiation with a mass number of zero and a plus one. Okay, this is a trend. Radiation that represents high energy. Gamma. Excellent. There you go. Okay. So those would be like the test like questions and you'll see that. Okay. So radiation protection requires paper clothing only for alpha. And that food for beta, a lead shield or a concrete for gamma. But the key is we have, we have to limit our time span in the radiation source. So if the alpha particle travels two to four centimeters, and only tissue depth, right? So shielding can be paper or clothing. And the typical source of an alpha is radium 226. A beta particle can penetrate four to five millimeters. So we have an idea of 45 millimeters. So we need to wear heavy clothing, lab clothes, and gloves. And an example of that would be carbon-14. Then we also have then the highest energy would be the gamma rays, which 50 centimeters or more lead concrete and technetium. So this is what Erica Schweitzer said. This is what they use a lot of and only for us, you know, most common radioactive isotope technician, 99M, okay? So what type of radiation will be blocked by a left shield concept check? Paper clothing, alpha, right? Very good. So you, you'll know that radiation chemistry is actually quite simple when, uh, when uh, at first you get if you look and read the textbook, it seems a little bit tough, but not really, right? It's, it's understandable. 
And some of you, as have to say, that already even did homework for chapter 10, but 11 was a little bit going deep into organic chemistry is getting a little bit uh, tough. So let's take a look at nuclear equations. So when we say nuclear equations, we have uranium 238 being bombarded, right? Say you could bombard it with a neutron or so, and then when you bombard it, so it's fission, right? It's a fission because it splits up into an alpha particle and a thorium 234 nuclear. And so here is the equation on the bottom that I want you to take note of. So you will you will know that if you have 238, there are 146 neutrons and of course, 92 protons, and then, and then uh, when it goes to thorium, 234. So 238 minus 234 gives you the helium nucleus, right? Helium, which turns out to be the alpha particle. So for the next exam, you will be asked, what is the missing particle here? given this equation. So then you will want to bubble the helium nucleus. Because you just subtract 238 minus 234. Easy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do we go about balancing them? Right? So in a balanced nuclear equation, of course, the mass number and atomic number may change, but the sum will always stay the same. And it has to be the same for the reactants and the products. So when we say alpha decay, right, because unstable nucleus, so we call it decay, alpha decay. When a radioactive nucleus emits an alpha particle, then we form, we form a new nucleus whose number is increased by 4 in an atomic number. So, in the next exam, I will tend to ask you not these questions, not this one, but tend to ask you <coughs> this one. In other words, what is this missing particle? Okay? So, so alpha particle is quite easy to remember because. It's just a helium nucleus. So a beta particle, on the other hand, is really an electron is being is being emitted, right? So we get a beta particle, so it's an electron. So the the mass number will stay the same, but then the atomic number increases by one, right? Because we're adding an electron. So when you see an equation like so, so when you see carbon-14 turns into nitrogen-14, so I'll be asking you what would be the, what would be the, what would be the missing particle? So you'll want to bubble the electron, the beta particle. So I won't ask you this type of questions, so I'll ask you the, the formula right now. now. This one. So for example, when this goes potassium, Converts into calcium 20, the missing particle will be a beta. So, yeah. This is all on D12. Has been on D2L since the first day of class. All the uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay? Right? And the kicker. 
I just added the concept check today. Okay. Okay? Good question, though. It's nice to check, right? So, positron. What's a, what's a positron? It's an anti electron or beta plus. So, how, how do we get a positron when a proton and a neutron, right? So, the atomic number of the nucleus will be the same but then the atomic number will decrease by one. So for example, manganese, 25, goes to chromium, 24. And so when you see that, right? So that's a uh, separate. When the atomic number decreases by one. And then, of course, when it's the gamma radiation, energy is emitted from a very, very unstable nucleus. So it starts out with technetium 43, meta stable. So 99M, M stands for meta stable technetium. And, it, and then it goes to, gives off gamma rays, so to 99TC. TC meaning technician, right? And that was the most uh, used radioactive isotope, sometimes Karen Timberlake as the question. So you'll see the summary of the types of radiation, alpha, beta, beta plus, and gamma. So how do we produce radioactive isotopes? We use a process called when we bombard it with a small particle, so that process is called transmutation. It doesn't, this uh, definition doesn't seem to come out during the exam, so I did a put it in our uh, So it's nice to know a new uh, So once again, I told you you won't get this type of questions, right, in the next exam. So different types of radiation measurements start out with, actually we have a Geiger counter, detects beta and gamma. How many have had experiences with uh, with uh, Geiger counter uh, with a stick? No? You know that when the sun bombards the earth with cosmic rays, right? So there's actually all forms of radiation that we are bombarded with. Yeah. Lots of protons and even tritium, right? The hydrogen three. But we're more interested in in the natural reactivity that's seeping out of the Earth's crust, mainly radon. When we were in California, there was lots of radon coming, coming up from the roof to actually <coughs> radiation coming out of the In Florida, because we're mostly, you know, limestone and so forth, we don't have much radon coming out of our, of our land. So Geiger counter detects uh, beta and gamma where the ions produced by the radiation creates current. So what are the units for measuring? Is a Curie, measures activity as the number of atoms decay in one second. So we have a Curie, a rad, radiation absorbed dose, or a REM, radiation equivalent, and refers to the biological damage from different types of radiation. So we will want to look at how, how we tend to measure radiation. So the activity is a QE, so the abbreviation is CI, 
the one CI is equal to 3.7 times 10 to the 10, and then the standard is a decimal, so there's a relationship between there. We have the absorbed dose, which is a rad, and then the biological the damage, which is a gram, which is a rad times a particular factor. So the measurement of an equivalent dose would be tend to be in milligrams, where uh, one gram is a thousand milligrams. We'll use that later when we do some some, uh, some problems. So exposure to natural radioactivity, right? Can you see a ground of air, water and food? Chest x-ray, we get 20 milligram. Dental x-rays, mammogram, 40 milligram. And then radon, remember I told you about the radon gas. And so our son, when he was actually in middle school, he did a science project on, um, there are some air plants, spider plants, that you can put in the rooms and it absorbs all the radon. We got second, second place in the competition. <laughs> that was really, really, really good. So LD50, what does that mean? Lethal dose, right? LD, lethal dose of radiation for some platforms. So it's the amount of radiation whole body. You see that also LD in, in drugs, right? Um, so how do you know like, the drug that's being given to a patient is actually the right amount? So sometimes, actually, the doctors don't know, right? They can boost it up or, or decrease it because the patient feels nauseous and other symptoms, right? So it's just something to, to know that LD50 doesn't just talk about the radiation, but could also be the concentration of the blood. So here's a typical question. Uh, the dose of iodine 125 for a thyroid is 100 micro, micro What is this in mega -becular? So one QE is 3.7 times 10 to the, so then you will look up, so in the next exam, so you want to write this, uh, you know, the table earlier. So just like we learned in chapter one, chemistry measurement, <coughs> write, always write down what is given. And then you want to convert it into QE so that then you can get into Beckwell's and then eventually get into the mega right? So by writing down first what is given, you're doing dimensional analysis. Doing dimensional analysis, so 100. So a typical interest gross of I-125 is 100 micro QA. So that's the given, right? So write the given down. And then you want to get rid of the micro QB. So we know that uh, QB, so you know that micro is 10 to the minus 6, right? So you want to write down uh, 1 QB over 10 to the 6 micro, so to can cancel. And then from our table there, 1 QB is equal to 3.7 times 10 to the 10 micro. And so you will note then that our calculations in chapter, chapters 1 to 8 were kind of simple. But you'll see later tonight as we review and do some post-test review of chapters 5, 6, and 7, and 8, some of the challenge questions tend to be almost like this, more complicated, not just one, two, three steps, but eventually five, six, or seven steps, right? But we're so used to CTVs, one or two steps, so our attention span, you know, gets lost, right? So we need to, we need to practice. Hence, you know, make sure you join Fiorella and her group or just go to the LRC and, and, uh, and avail yourselves of the tutoring that they have there. Because you need to make your, your eye, brain, hand the 
is when you solve problems. And also always have your calculator handy, right? This correct input. Here's correct. Okay. When you compute. And then, then we go to half-life. This is where we do some calculations also. So you'll note some conversions on Curie to Becquerel, but then calculating half-life. So what's the definition of a half-life? So consider like you have a long, uh, what do you call those? Like licorice sticks, cherry sticks, what? So you have a meter of that. Got that in half, that's like a half-life, right? Okay? So half-life of a radiation isotope is the time of radiation level to decrease to one half of the original value. So for example, for iodine-131, one half of the sample decays every eight days, right? The half-life is at eight days. So, so after 40 days, that's five half-lives, okay? So a decay, decay curve is always goes down there, decreasing, right? Whereas the growth curve will be increasing and then going on the top. Decay, and you see that it, it, it goes uh, like so, whereas the growth curve will be the exact opposite. Okay, so half-lives of some isotopes. some half-lives of some isotopes. We take a look at so carbon-14. The half-life is 5,730 years. So we don't use that in our medical applications, right? Because we'd be, we'd be dead, right? <laughs> the half-life 5,000. So we, we want to use isotopes like technetium whose half-life is six hours. You see that, right? So here's some medical. So naturally occurring, we have uranium-238, 4.5 times 10 to the 9 years <coughs> alpha particle. Radium to radon, 1,600 years alpha particle. But our medical applications, we have chromium, we have iodine, iron, and technician. So how do we calculate half-lives? If we're given strontium-90, and it have, has a half-life of 38.1 years, if the sample has 36 milligrams, how many milligrams will remain after 152.4 years? So this would be typical that's my questions. And you have some samples of that to work on in your concept check in detail already. Okay? So first you need to figure out, okay, we're given 36 milligrams of strontium and how many milligrams will remain after 152 years? So if we say a half-life is 38.1 years, we make our conversion factor. And then, so we say, okay, so four years, the number of half-lives, 152 in 38 years, right? So four half-lives. So if we have 36 milligrams to start with, then we end up with, after four half-lives, 2.3 milligrams of strontium. So this is actually kind of hard to visualize at first. That's why I would suggest like tonight, try to write it down on the, make a note card, a sample, like so, so that you can keep on every other day then I do a half-life, visualize a half-life problem and how it can be set up. Another one, carbon-14 was uh, used to determine the age of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Actually, I got to see that in the San Francisco exhibit. Uh, 
15 years old. If Dusty's folks were determined to be 2,000 years old and half-life of carbon is 5,000, what fraction of this half-life has passed? So they're given 2,000 years old and then the half-life of carbon is 5,000, so it's 0.35. Another tend, tend to be more like test-like questions. So you'll know that in the exam, you won't have like the carbon-14 question, but you'll have more, you'll have more of this uh, iodine-131 question, okay? How much of a 64 milligram iodine-133 is left after 26 hours if the life is 13, right? Some of you already have figured out that's pretty easy, right? So you write down what's given and what you find, need to find, and then so there, there it is, 16, right? So 13 hours, so 16 milligrams. So 26 over 13, which is the number of. So this one would be a good one to write down as a practice problem. To Think about putting a notepad or a sheet of paper. Or for those who have already solved chapter nine problems, you can just highlight it and get back to it. So, any questions so far from 9.1 to 9.4? talking to Erica yesterday in our lab, she said, oh, this is the most common technician where they image the skeleton and the heart muscle, brain, liver, heart, lungs, bone, spleen, and you see why it's most often used because look at all the different types of... Uh, then she also mentioned IDEA 131, or like uh, you mentioned hyperthyroidism and also prostate cancer. And then she also mentioned for the PET, right? Because what is PET? PET is positron emission, so emit, right? You give off. Positron emission tomography. Uh -huh. Okay? There's a new one, but it's not in our textbook. There's actually also a SPET, right? I'll have to ask, I forgot to ask Erica about that yesterday, <laughs> if Holy Cross has a spec also. It also, it normally uh, has to do with, it's pretty good for brain, brain imaging. And you can tell when, uh, when a, say a football player may have had you know, a concussion, and you take a PET scan. And it's also really good to determine which people, they may look like, uh, so, uh, there's a Dr. Amen in, uh, in LA who's been studying a lot of football athletes in their 50s. Their brain look like they're 80 years old, mm -hmm. but with the right I diet. The documentary here oh, you saw that? Yes, isn't that something? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was really interesting because uh, my husband's orthopedic oncologist. Mm -hmm. He and Dr. Raman were in, were in the same 
in the army and they went out to Harvard and so they said, oh, what a, you know, what a small world. Yeah. And so, so with the right diet and physical activity, that they, the... I think it's on PBS. It's on PBS, yeah. So you might want to find, find out a little bit more about that. Because you notice also people that are depressed, right? Their brains will look like 60, 70 year olds. And they can actually predict and say, oh, look, it's like initials, you know, you could start getting Alzheimer's. So then they, they can prevent it. So these days, it can be prevented. If it's so that's a really good point. So, so that's another. So you know that even if our book is really new, they don't have still the latest technology. So that's my passion, that you know, the latest technology. So scans with radioisotopes. So a radiologist always determines the level and location of radioactivity in a different radioisotope. So here's a scanner scanning the, the thyroid. And that's where radioactive iodine accumulated. So procedure emission tomography PET with a short half-lives. And so this is interesting. In 2008, I, I was still teaching at, at Mayai Day College, so I would teach on Sundays at Mercy Hospital. So I had a student. She, she worked with, at Mercy, at BG, and she was selling the equipment that they, they used to do. That. So that's why, you know, I get, I get interested in the new technology, technology because the students are coming and they want to further their career. She wanted to go become a doctor, you know, a uh, radiol radiologist. So, and then I think uh, Erica wants to, you know, you know how it is when you get a degree, then you get paid more too, right? <laughs> By the hospital, so that's a good thing. So that's something, yeah, I forgot to tell you, tell you at the beginning. Because there were not not everyone was here, so for next week, as an entrance pass, try to bring like what is your career goal and your life goal the next six months, the next year, and five years, and then how do you think you plan to do it, right? So we'll, I'll I'll try to read it and then kind of give it back to you. After exam four. Six months, maybe? Yeah, six months? Right. Actually, I should say I should say two months, right? Or one month? Because the goal here, my goal is not to get the A, right? <laughs> Chemistry is everywhere. Nuclear radiation is everywhere. I'm everywhere, right? <laughs> six, two months? Six months? Six months. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so what, what's our next exam? Let's look at our syllabus on VGL. Okay. Does someone have it handy? Oh, yeah. I know, I also have it handy. Okay. So, Rania, uh, what's our next exam? Uh, no, you need, you need this? Yeah. On 15? No, I think, let me go to the... <laughs> No. Is It was the same thing for last exam. We only did one day of work and next thing I will the next day. It was the I thought you would want to for last exam was like This one is 
This make a rev C and uh, accommodate. So we have a task in two weeks. And what's the other assignment? Okay. So, so our exam. So next week. So next week. Okay, so we were here, right? So yes. you're on commission tomography. 
so then we go to CT. What are CT scans? That's the computer tomography. So the computer monitors the absorption of actual beams based on the different tissue transmitters. And then we put the MRI. We chemists, we call that nuclear magnetic resonance, but because of the nuclear part, this was developed in 1960, and so they changed the word to magnetic resonance imaging. So it's the least invasive imaging. It works because the energy absorbed is converted into colors in the body. And so these are here's an MRI scan. So learning checks, which would be the isotopes that are used in nuclear medicine? A, B, or C. So potassium could be used because it's 12 hours, and iodine could be used because it's also eight days. So then we go to fission and fusion. U U-235. So when we bombard U-235 with a neutron, we get 236, which is very unstable. And then further, further decays into krypton, barium, and three neutrons. So nuclear fission is when a large nucleus is bombarded and splits, so fission, right, splitting into smaller nuclei. So make sure you know that, because that could be an exam, right? And then, you don't need to know the, the chemical nuclear equation, but what normally happens, you get a chain, of chain reaction, so it's not a good idea to be to be unprotected when you have U-235 uranium. Oh, if they're ever nuclear or water cooling breakdowns in power plants, right? Energy and nuclear fission from Albert Einstein's formula. Energy is equal to the mass times the square of the speed of light. Fission is when So here's our nuclear power plant. So fission is used to produce energy, and the control rods are the ones that absorb the nutrients to slow down the chain reaction. So then what's the difference between fission and fusion? Fusion occurs in the sun, right? And stars. So to form helium, uh, tritium combines with hydrogen atom to form deuterium. So tritium and deuterium combine to form helium plus a lot of energy. So learning chat, this would be like a, uh, what you would see in the questions in the next exam. When any splits, fission or fusion? Um, large amounts of energy are released. Small nuclei form from large nuclei. Hydrogen nuclei react and several neutrons are released. So fission, so when nuclei, hydrogen nuclei react, fuse, right? Small or large fuse, right? Both both give off large amounts of energy. So make sure you know the keywords, right? So that's that's quite easy. So now we move on to, to chapter 10. 10 is pretty easy. Yeah, some of you took in chapter 9 and 10 today, which is really good. Three students did chapter 9. So the chapter 10 lectures are here. And I, I haven't put the chapter 10 concept check because I will combine chapter 10 with chapter 11. 
together, so you see them in, in contrast together. And because it's it's the first time we may have heard of uh, uh, organic chemistry or an introduction to organic chemistry, although if you had me in lab, that was what we were working on yesterday, physical properties of organic compounds, and we were building like a models of different types of organic compounds. And this happens to be the introduction to alkanes, right? So alkanes, what are alkanes? Alkanes, so first, of course, we want to see what is organic chemistry. An organic compound that can have carbon and hydrogen and also oxygen, so for nitrogen and halogens, but also should also have phosphorus too, actually, too, right? Like our DNA. And we need energy, adenosine triphosphate, so there's phosphorus. And typical organic compounds, as we found out yesterday, also have very low melting points, low boiling points, very flammable, are nonpolar solvents, not soluble in water. So here we are trying to mix oil with water, right? But you see, right, the oil goes on top, and then the water, because it has, it, uh, because of the physical property of identities also. So organic versus organic, inorganic, so propane or gas grill, right? Remember, uh, you may, you may, uh, you showed me your, <laughs> your model yesterday, that's really good. So C3HA is our propane. And so propane is actually, when we write, when we write alkanes, So propane, C3H8, so we write down three carbons, right? And then we put, because carbon, carbon, that's why carbon is like the base because it has, can bond with itself, concatenate, and bond with oxygen, hydrogen, sulfur, and nitrogen. Right? So, so then, all we need to do is write down, so this would be the H, right? So, so, so there's your C3H8. And the formula for an alkane is CnH2n plus so the alkane, right? It just has carbon and hydrogen. So the first alkane that we made yesterday was methane, one carbon. So C, then one, two, three, four. But it's not really, it's not really 90 degrees. It's more like this, 109.5, right? So then we have ethane and then propane. So, so when you look at this, you see the pattern, right? That's part of our scientific method. Make observations, look at the pattern. So A, 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 so alkanes. So what do alkanes have? They have carbon and hydrogen, right? So you can go all the way down to propane, so C4. And uh, butane, this is has, propane has three, butane has four, that's a lighter fluid, and then pentane, right, five, right, but then not only can be straight chain, so we, will, we could write propane actually like this. Chemists just make you know, shorter symbols. This is the full structural formula. This is kind of like a shorter version. And then what we tend to see in exams or stuff like that. Right? 
right? C3 HA. So, so butane then would be like that, right? Pentane would be one, two, three, four, five. See that? What? Right? But what happens if they're kind of long and dangling like that? Well, you could have them form like so too. So this would be cyclopentane, right? You can make butane and you can make cyclopropane. Cool, huh? Yeah. Then of course pentane, hexane, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six. So then that's your cyclohexane. So those are alkanes, just carbon and hydrogen, can we switch it or can we cycle? Okay. okay, so I'm gonna erase this. And so we learned that in chapters one to eight, we learned about inorganic compounds. So this one has covalent bonding. This one, Na plus and Cl, so you have a metal and, and then a non-metal. So ionic bonding, right? Pretty interesting, right? Why is propane organic and sodium chloride not? Because of the type of bonding, right? One's propane, one's ionic. Okay, so let me check. Which would be the compounds that tend to be inorganic or organic? High melting point? NaCl, right? So inorganic. Not soluble in water. What did you say before? So it's not soluble in water, so organic, right? Because water tends to be the inorganic solvent. You, you notice like our aqueous our buffer systems and yes. stuff like that. Has a formula. So organic or inorganic? Organic, right? Organic, organic and magnesium chloride? Inorganic. inorganic. And easily works in air that means combustible, combustion? Organic. Very good. Coconut glass? Very good. Okay, you got that perfect. So that's pretty easy. Like you said, first chapter 10 was doable, right? <laughs> chapter 11 was doable. So we learned this, we learned this in chapter. I think uh, when we were doing chapter three, chem chemicals and their bonds, right? So the chemical structure of methane. And I mentioned to you that it's really important to know also the geometry of these molecules because later on when we'll be looking at Proteins, carbohydrates, and so forth. How drugs work depend are based on the uh, erase. Oh, sorry, <laughs> it's harder to see, right? <laughs>
Okay, then we have alkanes with substituents. What do we mean by that? And what are the properties and the functional So this is, this is actually pretty easy. Yeah, you say, yeah, it's easy because you know, right? And it has uh, a lot of vocal words to, to understand. So I'll case with substituents. So we can, we can write, we can write, this way, right? I did this earlier. I just drew two lines or one line like so. Or we can take take off this uh, methyl group. This is a CH3, right? Carbon with two hydrogens. Take off the CH3 and then put it where this hydrogen is. So then when we do that, that's called isomer isomers of butane. And so that's also important because depending on their shape, see, they have the same molecular formula but different atom arrangements. So these are very important local words. So substituents and alkyl groups. So when we say alkyl groups, it depends in L, Y, L. So if we had, if we have, so if we have methane, which is CH4, and if I remove a hydrogen from the methane, and make it CH3, right? Mm -hmm. So that's called methyl. If we have ethane, and we take one hydrogen, then it will be ethyl. Right? And then C3H7. And so on, right? So that's called the, these are called alkyl groups. These are referred to as alkyl groups. Okay. Now I know in the lab what we did was what if we put what if we put an OH in here? What would we call it? Alcohol. Alcohol. Very good. So for those that were in the lab, right? Whenever something we, we will call this our R group, whenever something has an OH, that's referred to as an alcohol. <laughs> That's what you know. We must talk today. Oh, sorry, because I'm for one age bunch. <laughs> okay, alcohol. And then, if we change that into NH2. This is called an amine. Okay. See, see how easy it is? Right? So this is amine. So then it becomes an amino group, right? Amine or amino group. So we can we can draw.
you know what was you know what was their uh, problem? <laughs> <laughs> but that's like us too, right? When you take 1032, you get into organic. Oh no, it's too hard. I'm gonna <laughs> don't do that. Okay? Because it's really, really easy. Really? Yeah, it's really, really easy. I'm not kidding you. Just give yourself some time. You're here already. You're really here. And this is what all my organic two students say. He said, you're really right. All you have to do is just, you know, give yourself time, but you got to really practice. You got to really understand. So I'm actually making you do a little thinking, right? Thinking is not bad. Thinking makes your left and right brain synchronize. You don't have to do too much yoga. Just do Tai Chi. <laughs> I'll show you some Tai Chi. So then, of course, the halo, when you have the CL, VR, F, pleurobromo, iota, right? So, so, so then, if it's a coral, right? So then, it, it would be right? Chloromethane, methyl chloride. See how see how easy it is? If you just know the rules, but then it's not us knowing the rules. You know how, yeah, life is like a wave, right? It's not always the same you bring <laughs> You have to pace yourself. I watched the beginning of it, and after the first goal, yeah. I would, if I was a coach, I would call it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Remember now, I coach, I coach my kids at referee FIFA soccer for, for seven years. Okay, so, so you see how, so that's what's referred to as substituent, or it can be called a functional group also, right? So I was really happy for once that a lab and lecture kind of fell within a few days of each other. So it was the same, right? I know, finally. I know, it's so way out of the uh, phase. And so you will just take note, I will post the concept check on chapter 10. I'll just put a short, you know, not too many, maybe five or six type, type of questions. Instead of learning to name them, I want you to recognize the functional groups because that's what's involved in the chemical reactions. Okay? Chemical reactions happen everywhere. Anytime. <laughs> so you want to recognize what's going to react if I see this, this uh, kind of thing together. Yeah. 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 No, no, no. Yeah, but feel free to give me on the last year. Yeah, so can you make a quick announcement to that? Um, there were two. Oh, remember? Yeah, stand up, Joy. Which one are you talking about? Oh, oh, you responded to the email, and when you, oh no, you responded to the video. Do you know that our videos are on YouTube, right? Yes. Yeah. How many have watched it? Oh, <laughs> respond to it. <laughs> yes. No, <laughs> I, I really like the. Did you think you're really. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, so okay. Continue posting. <laughs> okay, so properties of our chain. Did you sign me? I'm sorry? Did you sign me? I did. Thank you. Thanks for us. See? Now you guys are a team, right? Mm -hmm. You see that? Yes. Okay, so properties about mm -hmm. chains. We don't have to have two, but for those that we're not going to have, we do a quick run through, right? Okay, so our gases at room temperature and are what we use as heating fuels. Mm -hmm. So methane. Ethane, so actually mostly butane, right? It's 5 to 8 carbons. That's actually in our gasoline. That's why we have it. Yeah. Octane, right? Octane rating. And decane, of course, is 10 carbons. So all canes, some uses, right? The waxy coating in, in the fruits and vegetables have, are alkanes with more than 18 carbons. 18, that's a lot, right? So solubility and density of alkanes. So we know that alkanes already are non-polar. Do not dissolve in water, like the water uh, gasoline spills. Less dense than water, they float like oil. And you can, you know, light a fire there, right? So be careful when you walk down the swamps, right? And you, you may be, you think it's water, right? And it could be oil, right? Or fuel. Combustion of alkane. So whenever you combust, and this combustion, you learned that in chapter four, when it reacts with oxygen in the air, right? Mm -hmm. You always get carbon dioxide and water. So the products of combustion, lots of energy, and carbon dioxide. So of course, our refinery turns uh, crude into usable fuel, all the way to asphalt. So for us, we're really just concerned with the the organic chemistry for our sciences. So we'll look at the functional groups. What are the functional groups? For our case, when we say functional groups, the functional group, and this is what we had also in the lab, so what if we change, what if we change the OH into COOH, right? This one here, right? So this is called a carboxylic. And then this example is actually, this is actually our, our vinegar, right, that has 5% acetic acid. So this, this is acidic acid. And so there's our, there's our methyl amine, our fission smell, right? So how do we remove the fishy smell? We neutralize it, we, we put lemon yeah. and citric acid, so carboxylic acid. See how chemistry is everywhere? Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> we didn't know that, but you're actually always doing chemistry with your cooking. So then the smell of pears is propyl acetate. Normally at the central, we make 
we um, make banana oil. So one day each, each semester, it smells like, like bananas in building seven because <laughs> isopentyl acetate. This one is propyl acetate from the pears. Oh yeah, here's the bananas now. Here's the formula for the banana. Pentyl acetate. So what is the COO, right? It's called a an ester. So when you have So this is called ester. So ester. So organic molecules. chapter 10, 10.5, talks about the functional groups. So we have alkanes, but then so th those are alkanes, right? When you have two double bonds, so that's an alkane. When we have two double bonds, we call them alkenes, right? So carbon always still has four, four bonds. You see that? Mm -hmm. These are alkenes. Okay. Yeah, and then the three bonds would be alkyne. And then we have, so those are called functional groups, right? And then we have this. Oh, here it is. So alkene, alkyne, and then when we have double bonds, so this is actually referred to as an aromatic, but this is written this way. It can be written this way or so instead of this, now it's alternating, right? This can be written this way or that way or that way. That's why it's just written that way, okay? So this represents this, okay? And that's referred to as an aromatic. We also made that, right? Yes, So alkyl, alkyl, and the aromatic. So you probably will want to know some common names. This is called benzene. It's called benzene. And that's all of chapter 10. And we'll go on to So unsaturated hydrocarbons. What do we 
we mean when we say unsaturated? So there are also five sections. These are quite easy. You just need to know certain key keywords. Unsaturated means that they have double bonds in them, right? Unsaturated. Saturated are the alkanes. Unsaturated are the alkenes and alkynes. So what's interesting with the them is when we get, eth we say ethane, so ethene or ethylene. This actually, how, how do you ripen fruit? What, what do you do when you want to ripen fruit? And like you cover it. Yeah, you put an apple, you want to ripen a banana quickly, put an apple in there. Because it gives off, it gives off ethylene. Yeah. Did you know that? No. I don't know. I don't <laughs> what I think is when, when they don't eat fruit, we try to force right as mangoes. Oh, they wrap it in cheaper. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. And yeah. 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 Because it's mango season. <laughs> and you know, whenever there are double bonds, it smells good. So roses, geranium. So the smell of roses. <coughs> but you don't need to, you know, lemons, lemongrass, bay leaves. So they are unsaturated. And that's the way they get up. Lavender is one of my favorite ones. I used to grow lavender and roses together <laughs> with strawberries. <laughs> yeah. So. so then, this is quite important because like it's an introduction to the isomers, right? So when the isomers, when they're together, it's called cis. There you go. <laughs> and in fact, there's a German word for it that we have to learn in, in organic chemistry too. Put some. And then trans and <laughs> then Opposite trans, right? So you have to know, and what tends to come up in, in um, the exam is cis hexene and trans hexene. This tends to come up in you know, the best generator to recognize. So same side, cis, right? So it's all that. Trans and yeah. Okay. So in organic chemistry also when we go to the higher levels, we put E or Z and Gaden and Tsutsami. Same side, cis and Tsutsami. Opposite side, trans and So it's kind of like, like this, you know, your, your thumbs and then trans would be and the thumbs are opposite. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool, huh? So of course, since I'm trans in nature, certain silkworm moths, right, attract each other using pheromones, and we do have pheromones, insects, and so forth have their own pheromones. And just don't worry about naming them, just those two examples, understand uh, 
uh, difference between the cis and the trans. Now, what's interesting with the unsaturated, that means they have double bonds, right? Mm -hmm. So, because if they have double bonds for the alkene and the alkyne, so then we can add some hydrogens, right? Mm -hmm. So, if we want to add hydrogen in here, we can actually add a hydrogen and call it hydrogenation. Right? Or we can add water and call it hydrolysis. So we can add H, OH on that side and call it hydrolysis. So that's why it's called addition reactions because we're adding. Okay. We can ask and we can take away too. <laughs> so we want to remove the water, dehydration. <laughs> when we want to remove the hydrogen, dehydration. Okay. So let's look at some interesting. So hydrogenation, when we add hydrogen to an alkene, but we have to have a catalyst to make the reaction occur. What does a catalyst do? It puts hydrogen in a, in a correct arrangement, so it will, we can't have hydrogen dangling like here. The catalyst puts the hydrogen in the arrangement so that it is in the correct position, orientation. Halogenation, we can also add Br2, Cl2, I too, right? So pretty, pretty, that's pretty easy, right? So when we hydrate, that's when we actually make an alcohol. Yeah, there you go, right? Ethanol, drinking alcohol. That's a drinking alcohol, right? That's found in wine and beer and in liqueurs. So take note of the hydrogenation, hydrogenation, and hydration. And the reaction is quite easy because I just showed you how it attaches, right? So when this attach, so then we don't have a fire. So this means so now it's saturated. Okay? Yeah. So there's your hydrogenation. <coughs> and so we actually tend to hydrogenate to make margarine, right? For shortening. We hydrogenate vegetable oils, like canola oil, sunflower oil. <coughs> so I, I kind of showed you how to do it fresh, so you got it? I know we're kind of sleepy mm -hmm. and hungry. <laughs> so, you know, I got my PhD with polymers, right? I studied polymers. So, polymers are like plastic, so, our polymers called polyethylene. So, it's really Ethylene, right? Mm -hmm. Just repeat it. Repeat it. How many thousand times? Mm -hmm. So there's low density polyethylene, high density polyethylene. Depending on how many repeat units we have. Mm -hmm. So we say poly meaning many, and MERS is the repeat unit of, for polyethylene, the repeat unit is ethylene. Okay. So long chain molecules. Only nature and of course our DNA right, is a polymer, a biopolymer. Starch, cellulose in plants, our, our um, styrofoam cups, right? That were when we did our heat and energy experiment, polystyrene. You remember the formula I gave you? Um, the Tollywood, right? Yeah. Is that the aromat? Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's uh, one of the starting materials. So we just add ethylene plus ethylene plus ethylene to get 
only ethylene. So addition, same thing, addition reaction. So this end could be a million or 150,000. And you'll see like t-shirts, polypropylene. So the propane, so it becomes protein, right? There's a double bond in one of the uh, make t-shirts. Or Teflon, polytetrafluoroethylene. So with uh, ethylene, right? So tetrafluoro, so that means it has four F, Teflon. The starting material, polytetrafluoroethylene. So, so that's the starting material for for to make that one for the tents, right? And then our tissues. So that's pretty much what polymers will probably ask you what's poly. And say many and this And then on the aromatic compounds, we already know that it's called benzene. And then it can be like so, right? We covered that already. So some aromatic compounds in nature and in health, right? So vanilla and aspirin, we call it so acetyl. CH3, CO, acetic acid, right? Acetyl acetate. Or ASA. So here's the ibuprofen, and then there, there's a formula for acetyl benefit. Now what would be in the exam would be, you need to recognize, what do we call this group? This is called the hydroxyl, OH group, right? Hydroxyl group. This is called the ether group, CH3O. So, O, C, H, 3, so we are. So this is called ether, right? And this is called ester. See the difference between the two? Right? I will make sure I put one in the, each in the concept checks for chapters 10 and 11. Mara, is this it? Mara says repeat? Yeah, yeah. Repeat. Okay. Yeah, repeat, yeah. Okay. So here's the ether, right? Ether. Ester is COO, right? Ester, COO. Ether, R, O, R, right? And then, you also have something like this, C double bond H, right? So that's called an aldehyde.